So it, it is such an honor to be able to talk with you this morning and to think a little bit about the future. You'll have a day filled with amazing talks and insights and practice of yourselves and your colleagues. And so I'm really here to just try to see if we can maybe put this in a slightly larger uh, perspective and to give you a sense of uh, the kind of work and the things that are on my mind. Um, I will um, absolutely uh, make my slides available uh, and that can be distributed. So be happy to share those afterward. So this is a question that I spend every day asking and have for several decades now, more decades than I'd like to count. But I think this is the question that we should always be asking, which is what should our educational response be to the conditions of the world right now? But somehow this question has gotten more and more compelling and urgent the deeper we've gotten into the 21st century of what it means to really respond to the current conditions of the world right now. Um, in so many ways, that's what is the question that this wonderful showcase is asking all of the kinds of things that uh, the presentations today are addressing, students as partners, social justice, community engagement, inclusive pedagogies, neurodiversity, digital learning, transdisciplinarity, all of the themes that are gonna come up today are all trying to ask what should our educational response be to the conditions of the world right now. I get to ask those questions uh, every day from uh, my current position. I, like Sertle, I operate out of a house as well, uh, known as the Red House, uh, for reasons that hopefully this picture makes obvious. Uh, it's right across the street from campus, but it's symbolic that we are not on campus, but just across the street. I uh, just like Sertle is near that gate, one foot out, one foot in maybe. Um, and this past month began the 10th anniversary of this unit, the Red House that I founded and uh, was launched on November 20th, 2013, when our president gave a talk uh, that launched the initiative called the Designing the Futures of the University Initiative. And in honor of our 10th anniversary, we are launching a project uh, that has this framing. Um, we're calling it the 10 to the second project. And we're trying to ask the question, how might we design for the next 10 years with the next 10 decades in mind? And that's really one of the questions that I think we don't ask all that often in higher education. We tend to think of innovation as always being a variant from the present and therefore the past, as opposed to education and educational innovation being something that's helping us move towards something. And so that's the idea of this project. Um, it's not just what will education be like 100 years from now, it's the next 10 decades, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. When you think about it, the students that were graduating, if we were graduating students in their early 20s, they will be actively working in their careers for half of the next 10 decades, right? They will be having careers that will be peaking in the 2040s or the 2050s. In case you're wondering how I'm calculating when a person's career peaks, it's whatever age I am right now. <laughs> So just in case you're wondering how I was doing that math. Oops. So we ask this question, this 10 to the second question, in the middle of what I like to think of is something like a 50-year arc, a little bit arbitrary to pick 50 years, but something like a 50-year arc of what I would consider the transition to the learning paradigm. Um, and I, I just pick arbitrarily 1995 as the beginning of this 50-year arc because that's the year that uh, Robert Barr and John Tagg published uh, what was then a very, very famous and influential article called From Teaching to Learning a New Paradigm for Undergraduate Education. And in that article, they argued simply this. They said a paradigm shift is taking hold in American higher education. That was the context they were focused on. In its briefest form, the paradigm that has governed our colleges is this. A college is an institution that exists to provide instruction. That's the old paradigm. Subtly but profoundly, we're shifting to a new paradigm. A college is an institution that exists to produce learning. This shift changes everything. It's both needed and wanted. So this is what they called the 
transition from the instructional paradigm to the learning paradigm. I'm just going to, in that article, they have about a three page table with 30 some odd comparisons of what it means to shift from this to this. I'm going to show you like six. And they'll all feel very familiar to you. It's instructional paradigm, you deliver instruction. Learning paradigm, you produce learning. Instructional paradigm, you transfer knowledge from faculty to students. Learning paradigm, you elicit student discovery. Move from offering courses and programs to creating powerful learning environments. Faculty are primarily lecturers. Faculty are primarily designers of learning environments. You can see this was aspirational, of course. Instructional paradigm, you start with the parts and they're prior to the whole learning paradigm. You think about the whole curriculum and then the parts are aligned. Instructional paradigm, time is held constant, learning varies. Learning paradigm, learning is held constant, time varies. I'm not sure we're doing so great on that last one. I think we're still pretty much locked into the time held constant piece. But again, these were, this is what they said was part of this shift. And in talking about this shift, they said this change is a small change that changes everything. Simply ask, how would we do things differently if we put learning first, then do it? Sounds pretty simple when you put it like that. But key, they say, it will take decades to work out many of the learning paradigms implications. Just as a life hack, that's a great thing to put in any article you ever publish on anything. <laughs> to say, I'm right, but it may take decades for you to know that. So I've always tried to adopt that stance. 50 years, you'll say, he nailed it. So that's why I have this 50-year arc, because it'll take decades to work out many of the learning paradigm's implications. But it, to me, it, it's, it's almost comforting to not think of, like, why aren't we making more progress, or why are there still colleagues that think this or that? but instead to think, no, we're like in the middle of this multi-decade transition. And in that sense, you can feel that progress everywhere, including in an event like today. So the reason that I called my talk the forking paths of the learning paradigm is that I think that although this has been largely a, a, a absolutely essential and positive movement, there, there is this, this, this kind of uh, double side to the learning paradigm. And uh, it's captured a bit by uh, one, this is one of my favorite writers about education. I'm going to quote him a few times today, uh, Gert Biesta. Uh, one of the many books he's written is called Beyond Learning. Uh, he says, something has been lost in the shift from the language of education to the language of learning. He acknowledges that there's a great deal about the language of learning that's really powerful, teaching and learning showcase. But the risk is that once you start focusing not on inputs, faculty, instruction, but on outputs, what it is that students are learning, then you can start getting as granular as possible. Then you can start to overly focus just on narrow outcomes. And that's what he says, what he calls in a subsequent book, uh, what he calls the learnification of education. And again, not that learning is a powerful concept, but that there's this sense in which it has this double edge. So on the one hand, learning can be something that's very powerful because we're focused on, on what the impact is on students, but it can become very disintegrative and transactional, where learning is just about very narrow skills, very instrumental means. Or it can be very integrative and transformative. I think this is probably the primary tension in higher education right now is whether you fundamentally believe in a disintegrative vision, I, of course I'm calling disintegrative to be uh, provocative, but whether you think it's just about the parts or whether you think it's about a whole greater than the sum of the parts. And it seems to me that's a very essential challenge. So I'd like to propose that this is one of the great axes of education this disintegrative, integrative, transactional, transformational. The other axis, I would say, is not just what kind of education are you trying to provide, but for whom, and whether the education you're providing is inclusive, which I don't really need to explain, or exclusive. And historically, of course, exclusive excellence 
was what colleges and universities were for hundreds of years. They were about qualified and prepare students in rich holistic environments. But now we believe that we want to reach more people and reach more people in more diverse ways. You look up inclusive evidence on the web, you'll find tens of thousands of articles about education. If you look up exclusive excellence on the web, you'll find like stuff on luxury resorts in Mexico or something, right? That's, that's not a term in higher education, but in some ways it was the implicit ethos of higher education for hundreds of years. So like all good two by two models, you want to be in the upper right hand quadrant. <laughs> and this is where I would put, you know, when Biesta says the language of learning has taken something away from the language of education, this is where I'd put the new language of education. It's this, this quadrant, this quadrant that maximizes for inclusive and integrative is where we see things like growth mindset, teaching to the whole person, relationships and mentoring, belonging and mattering, helping students learn how to exercise judgment in conditions of uncertainty, which we might say is one of the highest things we can teach people, and helping students do work that matters, right? And you could put many other things in this quadrant, but to me, this quadrant is where we want to be, what we want to develop for, and it's starting to develop this language, which I'd say is the language of education, not the language just of learning. Again, Biesta, education is not just about the transmission of knowledge, skills, and values, but is concerned with the individuality, subjectivity, or personhood of the student, with their coming into the world as unique, singular beings. Right? And that's what he would say would be what it means to think about education as distinct, or at least as including learning. He says, the first responsibility of the educator is a responsibility for the subjectivity of the student, for that which allows the student to be a unique, singular being. He often writes mostly about K-12 education, younger education, but I find his writing to be extremely compelling for higher education as well. So he talks about education as being made up of three distinct but interrelated uh, goals. One is what he calls qualification. That's just like knowing stuff, knowledge, skills, etc. The second is socialization, and that's learning how to fit in. So you go to school, starting at five years old, to start learning stuff and to learn how to fit in. Both those are important, critical. But he adds a third thing, which he calls subjectification. And that's learning how to become your own person, how to emerge into the world, how to emerge into a world with other diverse people who are also emerging into the world. So the first two, you could say, you can cover with learning. But if you care about all three of those, then now you're talking about education. Now you're talking about education. Subjectification, how do we help people learn how to come into the world to, get, to become present in the world? So let me give you a concrete example, uh, just one from Georgetown, uh, one later. This is a program that we run at Georgetown uh, called the Regents Science Scholars. It was launched in 2016, and it was meant to address the problem that our lower income, very diverse students who were coming to Georgetown to major in the biomedical sciences were disappearing in the first semester or two, that we were just hemorrhaging low-income students in that first semester that they were getting to Georgetown. So this was meant to address that problem. And it was focused on a five-week pre-matriculation program where students would come in August, July and August, before they would enter Georgetown to get a kind of on-ramp into the university. And at first, they designed the program to like try to make up for 12 years of crappy schooling. It was like, oh, you got a terrible science education growing up poor? We're going to teach you everything you need to know about biology and chemistry in five weeks. <laughs> that went about as well as you can imagine. But as the professor says, we were focused on fixing deficits, not building strengths. So instead, after the first year, they completely reshaped the program to be focused on what they called professional identity. And, and they didn't mean that in an economic sense, but in the sense of think, helping them think of themselves as scientists. 
impact agency and community, that that's what they could do in five weeks. They could teach them a bunch of stuff, but it was really the identity and the agency that they wanted to give them. So the entire program was built around my wife and my favorite winery in Virginia, and this is not a coincidence, but I won't go into the story. But it came to be known as the Glen Manor Wine Project, and the scholars are work with this winery. They worked with this winery now for seven years. The professor, who in full disclosure is my wife, <laughs> she would describe that when they rebuilt the course, they covered absolutely as much content as they were covering before, except in the context of a project, of a project that really had some meaning to the students. And as she says, the students, who again, have arrived six weeks before matriculating to get a gentle on-ramp into Georgetown, they were surprised and daunted that they were the research team. But within one day, the most common phrase was, would this help Jeff? Jeff White is the winemaker at Glen Manor. So we take them out to the vineyard. That's Jeff there talking to them. It's a gorgeous spot. They design the experiments based on soil maps, et cetera. They collect the samples. They're divided into three teams, Team Micro, Team DNA, Team Quant. We had them all over for Glen Manor Wine when they were old enough at 21. And Team Microbe DNA and Team Quant were still talking smack to each other as they were in that first year. And then they present on campus in what is really a traditional research setting. There's 40 or more people there. And I just can't emphasize this enough. These are students from low-income backgrounds. They think they're stupid. They think they're imposters. They think that they don't belong at Georgetown. They've come here for a five-week on-ramp so they can succeed. And they're acting like scientists. And before they've even started Georgetown, they're doing science presentations for a community of people on campus working with one of the best winemakers in Virginia, where we get a lot of our wine. <laughs> Seven years this program has been going, the number of first-generation low-income students in biomedical majors has increased by 5x. And now more than 20% of the matriculating class of biology majors are first-gen low-income students. When the program started, it was 2%. Part of the success of the program is that they figured out that the most important thing to helping people succeed as scientists was to care about them and their subjectivity and to think about not just their qualification and their socialization, but how do you help them start to come into presence at Georgetown before they start. The Regents Science Program, to me, sits squarely in this quadrant of the integrative and the inclusive. And if we'd had have more time, or if this was a long workshop, I'd have you asking yourselves, where would you put UCC? Where would you put your program? Where on this axis would you plot different parts of UCC? Um, but to me, this quadrant is where we want to be, where we want higher education to be. But the question, I think, is, what would it take for higher education to be centered in this quadrant? What would it take for that to be our home? Is that just a matter of emphasis? Is that a matter of, you know, just increasingly doing the right practices and people retiring? Or is it a paradigm shift? Is this actually a paradigm shift for higher education? And that, of course, are the kinds of questions that we want to ask in this 10 to the 2 project. So when I think about paradigm shifts, um, I have found a framework that I want to share with you for the next few minutes, really useful. It's a framework that some of you may have heard of, but it's called the Three Horizons Framework uh, by a man named Bill Sharp and his colleagues at uh, an organization called International Futures. And I'm going to move through this pretty quickly and uh, happy to pick it up later. I'll be here all day and tomorrow, so look forward to speaking with all of you. So the idea of the three horizons is the idea is that there's three versions of the future that exist in any community simultaneously in the present. These are all versions of the future that exist in the present. So one version of the future, 
they would call H1, the three horizons, right? horizon one. This is business as usual. This is the dominant paradigm. I click to here. And this is the dominant paradigm, and this is saying that whatever has been the dominant paradigm, conditions have changed enough that it's a system that's losing strategic fit with the moment, right? Um, and so therefore, it starts to have diminishing returns. The nature of your students has changed. And so therefore, the old ways for a different kind of student body starts yielding diminishing returns. The nature of social media and the way people's minds work has changed. So just lecturing, like I'm doing, has diminishing returns. I always find that ironic that I'm always giving lectures on the death of the lecture, but we probably all are in that ironic space sometimes. To keep H1 going, you need a managerial perspective. People get locked into this approach. When people say, why has change so hard? It's because we're locked into H1. The second one is what they call H3, just to be a little bit confusing, and that's the emerging future. That's the new paradigm that's better fit for the conditions of the world. This is a visionary perspective that asks, where are we going? And that perspective always has seeds of the future in the present. And I would say what's going on today is all about those H3 seeds. And then the third horizon, again, labeled H2, just to be confusing, is the disruptive innovation. It's that both internal and external disruptions happen that either have the effect of sustaining the dominant paradigm, which is they again call H2 minus, or helping the emerging paradigm to come into being, which they call H2 plus. This is the zone of transition. This is the system seeking to exploit the opportunities that are emerging in changing conditions. They would call this the entrepreneurial perspective. So just to put it all together, there's H1, which is going away, H3, which is emerging, and H2, which is the disruption. And the questions that are asked is, what is being born, and how can we help it arrive well? What is fading, and how can we help it leave and go well, go and leave well? And what is being disruptive, and how can it be harnessed and not captured? And each of these three things exist on a campus at the same time. And each requires a different mindset, a managerial mindset, an entrepreneurial mindset, or a visionary mindset. And the purpose of Three Horizons is so a community can have a conversation. It's, you don't put something in and run out and get the, get the future comes out the other end. It's just for a way for a community to talk about how, in a community, everyone is operating with a different sense of what the future is. So let's populate this. Now I'm going to pull the terms from Barr and Tag's article that I showed you that list of side-by-sides. I'm just going to throw those up now into three horizons. So on the left are some of the things they said the instructional paradigm was. Transfer knowledge to students, deliver instruction, atomistic, faculty primarily lectures. That's the instructional paradigm. And that's what they say the learning paradigm is. We'll put that up in H3. Student discovery, produce learning, learning environments, holistic. Here's some seeds of that emerging future. I arbitrarily picked active learning, project-based learning, equity-minded pedagogies. Here's some things we hope to get rid of. Assessment without feedback, inequitable practices, passive learning. So you're following here. Once a community has started to map, what do you think is the dominant? What do you think is emerging? What are the seeds? What's going away? Then you can start to ask, then what's happening on the H2 line that creates change? What are those H2 disruptions that are either internal or external? So for example, you could throw COVID in here and ask, did the, did, did the move to remote instruction, did we learn anything in two years? In what ways did the COVID adaptation help sustain the dominant paradigm or help to usher in a new emerging paradigm? I think it's complex. The answer is probably some of each, or we'll see. Time will tell. 
Where do the innovations here at the Teaching and Learning Showcase fit? What if you think of them as H2 disruptions? They are things that you are doing inside UCC that are helping to bring the dominant paradigm and help it fade and help the emerging paradigm come into being. That's what's happening today and in all your amazing work. So what do you think is the emerging future paradigm for UCC? If you were starting to populate that H3 on your own, again, if we had more time and I believed in student-centered learning, I'd ask you. <laughs> I threw some things up that I gleaned from the program. You want to help students make an impact, turn them into caring practitioners, create a mentoring and supportive culture, create change makers, help your students have a thriving life, help support economic mobility. A lot of things could go up there. What goes up in H3 if you're thinking about the next 10 decades? What goes in H3 if you're asking, how is education an intergenerational force for good? What kind of design decisions would we make that might be different if we were not just designing for the short term? So I'm going to just stand in as a proxy for that. I'm just, uh, here's a quotation from a wonderful writer that some of you may know named Laura Rendon. is a great piece she wrote called Prelude to a New Pedagogical Dream Field. She says, I join the many existing voices of educational innovation to contribute to the generation of a new tipping point, a movement that wishes to create a new dream of education. The foundation of this dream is a more harmonic, holistic vision of education that honors the whole of who we are as intellectual, compassionate, authentic human beings who value love, peace, democracy, community, diversity, and hope for humanity. I think that's a pretty good paragraph can stand in for a vision of H3 for the future. Not something we typically think about as where we're hoping education innovation will take us. So I've now put that up in my H3. <laughs> I just have her quotation up there to stand in for a different kind of emerging future. So what does it mean to design for that intentionally? Here's a second example uh, that I'll show, and then I have one more thing, and then I'll try to end with a little bit of time for questions. This is a new program that we just launched uh, in environment sustainability, literally approved by our board five days ago. Um, and the Red House, my unit, spent two years designing this program with uh, our Institute for Environment and Sustainability. But this has been a major project of the Red House, is designing this. And we very self-consciously have thought of this degree as an H2 disruption. We ask, what does it look like to create a new degree that is trying to bring a new paradigm into existence? And we designed it around knowledge, of course, and experience, but also grounding students in complexity, grounding students in humility and personal formation. And at the center of it, we imagine that if we're going to have a sustained existence on this planet, it can't be just about cognition or technical solutions to the environment. It has to be an inner change. It has to be about inner transformation and what we think of as the inner outer cycle. And at the heart of that is what we call ecological belonging. So there's a million things to tell you about this degree. I'm going to just give you a couple details. Each of the first four semesters is a nine credit block that mixes science with ethics or science with humanity or science with history. And each of the first four semesters opens and closes with a separately credited course, one we call the opening interruption, which is meant to take a beginning of each semester to interrupt people's assumptions about their learning and a closing integration like a massive simulation or design exercise. And then across the years, experiential learning at every level, research rotations, internships, global environmental immersion, and peer leadership. Every student in the program has six credits of peer leadership in their upper division to serve as a peer teacher or a peer mentor to make the rest of the degree work. I mean, that's, that's how we we're starting to think about what does it look like to do degree design that's trying to bring a new paradigm into existence. 
And as I say, miraculously, it passed. Uh, just really quickly, I'm happy to talk with anybody who's interested later. We also are, are taking this idea out. And this semester, we've been running a, a global ecological belonging project that this fall have 54 student innovation fellows at four universities. And by the first quarter of spring, we'll have 100 student innovation fellows at eight universities on six continents, helping to construct a global meta curriculum around ecological belonging and this question of what does it mean to reimagine the question of higher education addressing how shall we live? How shall we live? Not just technical solutions. So that's what we think of as a degree bringing something into existence. Now let me just give you one more glimpse and then I'll wrap. Let's take a different kind of disruption. Let's take AI. This is not an internal disruption where you design a new degree that changes things. This is coming from the outside. This is just the palate cleanser here. Since you can't read that, it says, how am I supposed to start a robot apocalypse when you keep making me write term papers? <laughs> As I'm sure has happened on this campus, a lot of people are going through many different phases of reaction to the generative AI. It may start with policing, like just ban it. In fact, I noticed a couple talks today on this subject. Or maybe it's adapt. I was saying that people should, you know, do you have blue books or green books? I was saying people should invest in, because handwritten in-person exams are coming back. But then there's the movement of how do you integrate AI? How do you help students use it responsibly? How do you help students use it creatively or innovatively? But I don't think it's going to be that long till we start getting to the next phase, which is, well, my gosh, this changes everything. What does it mean to write? What does it mean to have an authentic thought? What does it mean to do honest work? What does it mean to be creative? What does it mean to be human? And then who knows what's after that? But if our students, again, for the next five decades and beyond, are going to live in a world where they will be adding human value to AI-integrated work, then isn't that our key responsibility as educators? Isn't that now job one? This is an infographic I just came across, 120 mind-blowing AI tools. Right? ChatGPT came out last November. It's like a year ago, none of these tools existed. <laughs> and then as Ethan Mollick, who's one of my favorite writers on AI, says, the only thing I know for sure is that the AI you are using today is the worst AI you are ever going to use. <laughs> so three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I've been working in educational technology since 1993. <laughs> I've never seen anything have such a rapid impact on the environment as AI. So at Georgetown, we launched something called the uh, Initiative on Pedagogical Uses of Artificial Intelligence. We issued a call in September in five categories. We got 90 submissions. One of the categories was called Student X Grants. A third of these came from students, 34 grants from students. So we're just getting that underway. And in January, we're launching something called the Georgetown Design Lab for AI and Transformative Education to create a community practice but for the most part, the most important thing to bring everyone together is just this. With the explosion of AI, what would it look like to get this right? right? We don't have a long time to figure this out. And for us, for all the things that AI can do, personalization of instruction, improve creativity, lifelong learning, expand perspectives, critical thinking, what's at the center is how do we help students work with AI to develop their unique contribution to the world? There's actually a very powerful alignment between the need to help our students figure out how to contribute uniquely to a world saturated during their lifetime with AI and Biesta's notion that the educator's greatest responsibility is to the subjectivity of their students. So this is what the 10 to the second question is for me. It rings at a question that I've been asking now for a few years. 
which is as machines get better at being machines, which is the very definition of machine learning, are humans getting better at being human? And might not that be the project of higher education and what it means to have an educational response to the conditions of the world right now? This is what I always used to ask. Then I got yelled at by a bunch of computer science faculty at different places I've been talking, so I've revised it slightly. It's less poetic. That's why I have to start with my old one. It was much better. As humans create AI, and humans and AI move toward integration, we better ensure that we're centering human value and our humanity. Again, this is what it means to talk about education and not just learning. So I close with this passage. One more word from Gert Biesta. It's one of my favorite lines of any of his writing. To engage in learning always entails the risk that learning might have an impact on you, that learning might change you. This means that education only begins when the learner is willing to take a risk. It's beautiful just as it is, including saying that one of our gr greatest obligations as an educator is to help learners feel comfortable taking a risk. But I also like to think, what if you substitute learner for teacher? Education only begins when the educator is willing to take a risk. Or what if we put the institution or the university there? Education only begins when the university or the institution is willing to take a risk. So every one of you, all the people presenting today, have taken a risk. And what's at stake is not just the future of your students' learning and your students' lives, but as I've tried to show, the future of all humanity. So thank you, and good luck.